We need to, yeah, we actually need to get. That's a good way to think about it. Mm. <clears throat> You're ready for this shit. Okay, bitch. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna say three, two, one, and wait five seconds. Okay, recording. Hello everybody, this is Quirin Powell. My name is James Sikowski and this is... Jody Martin. And this is the first episode, hopefully of many, of uh, this podcast. So, uh, Cola, how about you uh, introduce the topic? Okay, well, we just kind of pick topics out of the air. We don't really have anything in mind. So my first topic is uh, this guy called Raoul Wallenberg, or Wallenberg. Uh, he came into my head because a friend of mine did, like, a project on him, and she talked about him all the time. He is this uh, Swedish humanitarian um, who, during World War Two is credited with saving... Uh, tens of thousands of Jews by giving them diplomatic immunity. So what he did was he wrote these like pieces of paper, or these papers for them, um, because in Nazi Germany you had to carry papers. So if they were asked for their papers, it would say they were Jewish, but it would also say they were Swedish, so they couldn't be sent off to concentration camps. So this guy went around and gave loads of people these papers, even if they weren't Swedish. He was just trying to save their lives. So. Um, Anyway, it ended up that he disappeared and no one ever knew what happened to him. Right. Um, so my first question is, do you think it's right that a man like Raoul Wallenberg, Wallenberg, who you hadn't heard of before this, had you? No. <clears throat> do you think it's right that a man who saved the lives of tens of thousands of people is lesser known than someone like Heinrich Himmler or like obviously Adolf Hitler is quite well known for different for lots of reasons. Right. But people like Heinrich Himmler are quite well known generally. But people like Raoul Wallenberg, I don't know. Do you think that's right? Well, the way I look at it, it's not exactly an opinion, but in, in the eye of the public, we tend to focus a lot on the negative. We, everything we do see, for example, with all the uh, terrorist attacks that have been happening, it's putting a very negative light on the millions of Muslims, passive, peaceful, good people. And similar situation with uh, all these uh, American war criminals, like you know, people that go to Iraq, go to these uh, places, literally rape women. We hear about negative even though go on well you see that topic is in itself another topic because there are like hundreds of hundreds, thousands of military soldiers in america i i'm not pro-military i'm anti-military i don't particularly like america i don't particularly agree with their uh, foreign policy but there are hundreds of thousands of soldiers in america who believe they're going off and fighting for the right thing and who are respectable soldiers and who follow the codes of war and, and yet know, we only hear about the negative thing because that's how that's how media is you won't get views if you don't be negative you won't get views if there's no killing you won't get views if uh, you're you're not talking about rape or you're not talking about you no know, killing of innocent children and that's <clears throat> in my opinion people don't want to be bad people want to know there are bad people just in, invertly, just I it doesn't want make to. Makes sense. Like, would you not want to know that there's good people in the world? But that's the thing. We wouldn't know there's good. You know, we wouldn't have the about the bad. But of course, media has taken it way too far, and all we do hear about nowadays negative things. We don't hear about all these heroes, Africa, all these, uh, you know. Uh, donations that are happening just because they don't they're not as grandeur as bad things are happening because you if you help a thousand people 
it's still not as great as killing 10. Well, you see, I think the thing is, like, as well, like, the effort it takes to help, let's say, a thousand people, the money you have to raise, all the, like, loops and different things you have to jump through, um, all the different challenges that are presented by trying to help people. It is so much easier to, like, go, like, even you see in America, you know, every couple of months there's some fucking school shooting or some kid just goes into somewhere and, like, shoots it up and kills other people for no reason. It's so much easier to, like, just kill 30 people than it is to actually help 30 people. Yeah. Which I, I don't understand that because if something's harder to do, you usually get more credit for it. Yeah, it is quite backward. Like, like this. Well, if if you if you look at the news, there are obviously happening around the world, right? But they're just not as interesting, not as risque. Negative. Good isn't sexy. Good isn't sexy. That is a good way of looking at it. Which is why I'm a naughty bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I, I do believe, <laughs> I, I do believe, and uh, uh, <laughs> just, just to point this out, Clodagh did have, I don't know how many drinks before this point, and a lot, a lot. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, to be honest. We will never hear about the positive things unless there was no negative things. And the if... thing is, like, I think that's a lot to do with, like, I mean, there are conspiracy theorists out there that would say that you're fed this culture of fear to keep you fearful, to keep you submissive, to distract you from all the shit that your government is doing in terms of, like, I... Like, there's a very good documentary called Bowling for Columbine, which is about gun control in America and why America has such this, this huge, massively high death rate by gun crime. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, its closest number is Canada, and it's something like nearly five or six hundred per year less. Right. Which is a big difference. Oh, it's a huge difference. Um, but in Canada, like per capita, there's the same amount of gun ownership. The same kind of regulations exist in terms of getting a gun isn't that hard. But if you look at Canadian news and if you go into Canadian streets, people don't lock their doors. People aren't fed this culture of, oh, there's this guy that's going to come in, steal all your shit and rape you and leave. Like they're not fed that like America are. Like there's been so many cases where like, there was a case where this guy called George Zimmerman, who was a white guy, shot yeah. this black guy. I've heard a lot about that case. Yeah. He just shot him because he was a black guy and he thought he was going to do something. Which has its own racial origins as well as, you know, but the whole thing is they're fed this culture of fear. And so is everyone, really. It's like in America, it's ramped up to a thousand. But every country, I mean, if you watch the news here, I mean, the news makes me cry here. Because it's just full of sad stories. Like, I mean, at the same time, it's not good to be pumped full of good stories either, because that's just not realistic. Exactly. But it should be an equal thing of, yeah, this really horrible thing happened, but at least there's someone in the world who's trying to do a bit of good. Right. See, I think negative things are so much more powerful. You know, that's not that's not a good thing. All right, but um, you couldn't have an equal amount of good things and bad things happen because you need a lot more good things happen to level or balance out one bad thing, right? So, for example, uh, at least a few hundred people were killed or in the you know, terrorist attacks that happened previous year. And yet, you know... In Paris or...? Where? In, in Paris, in in, uh, in Syria, everywhere. Around the world, really. Um, 
and we're not only talking about you know Muslims we're talking about terrorist terrorist attacks in general these things happen and they destroy lives right so you can't go on the news and be like you know this person here helped save 10,000 lives because we don't feel that we don't we might be shown that we might yeah, all about it but we don't feel the good things as, as much as we feel the bad things because but that's because we've been conditioned to appreciate or to value bad things more than good things why do you think we appreciate not appreciate but in terms of appreciate it emotionally in terms of you register right, right, bad right. things emotionally more than you register good things like you just said it takes more good things to produce the same emotional response as like one bad thing like if one person goes in and shoots up a school it will take like a whole community of helping each other and you know you know trying to change things for the better before a good story can come out of a bad story but it will take like, it only takes one kid to go in and shoot up a school it will take a hundred thousand, a hundred million people to get America to change the gun laws. Right, yeah. So for a good thing to come out of a bad thing, it takes much more of a Yeah. Yeah, see I, I think I think this is why not a lot of people you now going back to our topic at hand, not a lot of people may have heard about a See, I already forgot his name. Ralph Wallenberg is his name. <laughs> there you go. Like, when you say Adolf Hitler, I know exactly what you mean. Exactly. If I say Stalin, you know who I'm talking about. Exactly. If I say Paul Pot, you know who I'm talking about. Chairman Mao, fucking Osama bin Laden, you know exactly who I'm talking about. But if I named off, like, humanitarians who did so much to help people, half of them, like, like, even, like, this is awful, like, there's a... That girl who, I think her name was uh, Yalawe, Malawe, she's the girl that won the Nobel Peace Prize. Yusafi. I'm not going to even try and... Malala. I hope, oh Jesus, I really hope I got that right. <laughs> Did you put her <laughs> the <laughs> name? Because otherwise it just looks really bad. Okay, now tell us about what she... I don't know, Mal yeah, Malala Yousafzai, Yousafzai, okay, she's this girl who, um, I can't remember, I think it was like, it was a Middle Eastern Europe uh, country, she's a Pakistani girl, Okay. and uh, she essentially stood up for, like, she wanted to go to school and she wanted to be taught like her male counterparts were, but because she lived in a country that women and men aren't equal at all, and it's, you know, very strictly religious and you know women aren't meant to go to school they're just meant to you know become good ones. listen to men yeah right. she stood up and she said i want to go to school and i want to learn and all this kind of stuff and anyway she ended up getting shot in the face and she sprung this whole movement of getting girls educated getting you know helping you know girls who are in danger, helping girls who are being married off at really young ages, all this kind of stuff. She won a Nobel Peace uh, Laureate for it, or a Nobel Laureate for it. But the thing is, that girl is the same age as like Kylie Jenner or Kendall Jenner. I don't know the difference. Kylie Jenner. But the fact is, if you asked people on the street, who's Kylie Jenner? Who's uh, Malala Yousafzai? People, you I'd tell about you nine out of ten times people will not know who Malala Yousafzai is but yet they know who this fucking half wish who I don't even know what she's famous for I don't I don't even know what she does yet when she you mention selfies. when you mention her name I know exactly who yeah exactly and the thing is like money breeds popular yeah and also sweet. you know look at Donald Trump People like people like money and people like people like ditzy nice thing. 
People no. like the fluffy things that don't make them think about the bad things. Exactly. People like fluffy things. Like people Which have one? people have, you know, their own issues. So when they hear about the bad things, uh, it affects them in two ways. Uh, what's really happening is it's taken away from their own issues subconsciously. You don't you know you don't think about why that's why we bad things are bad, but Bad things make our bad things look bad. It makes us look like we make up trouble. We make up trouble that's happening around us. Really, you know, in perspective, nothing. Uh, so we don't want to hear like, about it. That's a good point in terms of why, like, Raoul Wallenberg isn't as well known. Not because he did a really good thing or it makes it. us look worse no not even that but that you could you could say that is also a thing like i don't know if it's particularly that but i think it's because he did a good thing that stopped such an awful thing happening to so many people in terms of like if he hadn't helped those jewish people they probably would have been shipped off to concentration camps they would have been killed they would have had to endure awful things and you know unimaginable crimes against humanity never mind just Jewish people and you know I think it's the fact that the good thing he did is connected to the bad thing right that when people are talking about it they're also kind of thinking about all the people who didn't get an escape who ended up in Auschwitz and you know all Dachau and all those different places mm -hmm. and I suppose I mean, whenever I watch documentaries about any of those kind of places, I'm kind of just overwhelmed with this sense of sadness that it happened. And I suppose maybe people don't want to talk about the good things because they can associate them with all those emotions. In terms of when you talk about a bad thing, you can kind of go, oh, Jesus, isn't that just terrible? And that's kind of it, like totally out your head then. Right, yeah. See, no good things would happen out the bad thing or a condition not think about either. We haven't specifically mentioned the bad thing. Yeah, I suppose. That's why we tend to forget about the good thing. That like makes it wow. How many things go under a radar? No. We've seen all this you know, bad that's happening in the world. And yet, you don't hear about all the amazing things that could be happening because they're not, you know, they're not there because you don't want to think about them. Because you don't want to hear about 10,000 people uh, finally getting a source of fresh water because they didn't have a source of fresh water. Negative. You know? Yeah, I, I suppose know. with something like that, I mean, to, you know, you know, obviously, like, you know, a village of people getting a source of fresh water for the first time, you know, obviously reduces all the chances of diseases and all that kind of stuff. And it's, you know, a big step forward in making sure that people are becoming more and more equal, no matter what part of the world they're from. But I suppose the thing is, if you're sitting on your couch, and you're watching your flat screen television and you're sitting there with a cup of tea and biscuits and you're hearing about someone who, who just got fresh water for the first time in their life today. Yeah. It's also kind of the guilty thing of how much you have. Makes you feel like a dick. Yeah. Because you'll then go out and tell your friends like, oh, listen to this village here or there has gone as a water but really what you're trying to do is try and make other people feel guilty with you so it's relative. you see that's also down to the fact that if you look at charity adverts today it is like well what i would call it is like poverty porn they show you the worst of the worst to make to evoke your guilt rather than your compassion in terms of like people give money to charity not because they actually like 
oh actually this is a really good cause and I feel really passionate about it and you know I totally and utterly relate to that person and the struggle that they're going through and how awful it must be for them it's not that feeling that's pushing you to give money to people jangling the boxes it's the I feel guilty I feel pressure yeah. so I'm going to give money so that they go away and then I don't feel that anymore Yeah, that's mental. You you don't think about a lot of things like that. And, you know, just the two. We can't really, we can't really see a perspective outcome. Yeah. If we, if we had, you know, a third world guest could tell them Know, about these issues we see the uh, problems we're having they would laugh in our face mm. because they're battling they're fucking battling HIV or in whatever else we're just here like oh my god I feel guilty I didn't put 50 cents in the broker box it's you know yeah, I suppose uh, you think about it in terms of like, uh, you know, like there's some, like, even thinking about it right now, like there's some refugee family that's living in a bloody tent at the minute that have mm. no home and no country to go back home to, who might not know where the rest of their family is, or if they're alive even. And when you think about like that family and what that family's going through, or, you know, maybe some you know child in sub-saharan africa that is starving and you know has cholera or you know dysentery or something when you think then of your own problems you realize that your problems are very privileged problems and that you're you know even when you think about the way you think about stuff and the way you approach things is and your opinions and all the kind of things that form who you are. If you look at someone who maybe comes from a, a less well-off background, less educated, less opportunities, how they think about things will be different as well. So it kind of has to do with, I think, a lot of to do with, first of all, kind of the problems that you're facing in terms of like for the child in sub-Saharan Africa. The main goal is to live. Exactly. Where Reach like, tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and hope that tomorrow is a little bit better than it was today. Um, and then I suppose as well, you know, let's say, you know, that, that child's problem is just survival. Let's say you have, uh, I don't know, I can't think of a problem right now, but you're facing a problem or whatever in a country like Ireland or whatever, depending on how you were raised and what kind of education you've gotten and your social upbringing and all that kind of stuff will depend on how you deal with that problem. Yeah. Let, yeah. Let's say mental health, for instance. Right. Let's say you're raised in quite a, well, like not, you know, comfortable, liberal, middle class upbringing. Middle of the road. Yeah. You're well, you're well educated or you're, you know, you've reached third level. You have at least one parent who's reached third level or someone, you know, a parent who's working or a parent, you know, something like that. Uh, you're, you know, let's say you don't have much of a religious association either. If you're a member of that family and you're dealing with something to do with mental health, it is more likely that your family's going to talk about it. It's going to be more open. There's going to be more discussion about it in your house as you're growing up. Whereas if you come up from a very conservative, uh, I don't want to say not educated, but less well-educated background where you're kind of encouraged to leave school early to go find a job, which is perfectly fine in its own right. Everyone's entitled to do what they want. 
but if you come from a family that's kind of like that, you know, maybe traditionally quite Catholic, the approach to mental health is more of a don't talk about it kind of thing. Right, yeah. So even the varying within like privileged society, um, to, you know, not, I don't want to say developed society, but society where problems are not just whether I'm going to make it to tomorrow. Problems that are like, you know, in the grand scheme of things, very irrelevant. Like, I'm not saying mental health is relevant, but I mean, in terms of like, you can't get your internet to work. Right. How, how many more weeks? Oh. Yeah, or I need. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. How you deal with that or how you deal with problems is even divided within a society that is considered to be very privileged. Like Irish society is, is a privileged society. And depending on your social background and your kind of socioeconomic religious thing, it will depend on how you and the people around you cope with things. Yeah, like I would think if I wasn't on time, I would have a comp right. like yeah. I would probably I probably wouldn't be uh, with a gay person, probably wouldn't be a good friend. Black person, like it is. Yeah, that's Brandon. <laughs> shout, shout out to B boy. That's it. Yeah, uh, I would not be good friends with these uh, comparatively different. We see, like for me, because of how close-minded Poland. Well, Polish right society. now, yeah, Polish society. Uh, well, my generation for it. Because now we think my generation break through. Because uh, Poland hasn't been independent for a hundred years yet. It's gonna be independent for a hundred years, even four to six years from now. Okay, sorry, two to. And uh, communism put a big impact on how people think. We like to ourselves. Mm. We don't like different. We don't like you. Like my father would well not anymore. But he was racist. Mm. Or he when he first came he would, you know, he would say some under threat. He wouldn't he wouldn't exactly do anything about it, but he would be racist right. in, his own, in his own right. Yeah. And even, you know, if you consider Poland, even 10 years ago, left, it was a first world country. You know? yeah. And yet, opinions could be different. Same situation in, with like England and France, for example, in England, you know, people can dress whatever they can, have they can dress it. But in France, you can't you can simulate. No, it's no well, longer. The thing with France is, it's a lot to do with how they dealt with their colonies and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, it's obviously not such a big thing today. But uh, you would assimilate to the ways of the French, because you know. It, it sort of makes sense when you force But you them. do you not think that you've assimilated to the ways of the Irish? I think I have. I speak your language. But I, no. <laughs> I'm you bilingual. Speak language our colonizers left with us. I could kind of speak. <laughs> but see, the thing is, you don't speak your Well, you do. I do. Well, you as in most the Irish, Irish people. people. Yeah. Don't speak Irish. Uh, but uh, that's not that's not where I was going with that. I was going I was gonna go to 
say that people in France, are, if you look at it, the outside, very similar first world countries, they have vastly different opinions. Things like uh, religious freedom, religious freedom, foreigners, things like that. I have no clue where this tangent comes so far from our topic yeah but i suppose like, it's so, <laughs> like it really doesn't matter about the topics we could no it doesn't really it's, it's the spark yeah, yeah exactly it's a spark conversation uh, but i suppose like i don't i don't really have an outer perspective in terms of like i've obviously born and raised in ireland i don't really have any other kind of nationality influencing me because well, you, you spend a lot of time in france as well yeah, but that, that's more like I understand French society rather than I'm actually a member of French society. You can't, you can't, you're not biased. No, and uh, I understand how French society works and, you know, the French attitude towards things. But I suppose the kind of something I would notice, especially if I'm watching like English politics or English television and even like, if there's a program on a for called Gogglebox. And even like the English attitude towards things and the French attitude towards things, you can see kind of like the, the, not, I don't want to say like the attitude of a colonizing country as far down into its kind of like population. Right. In terms of like, obviously England and all those places did at one stage, they were you know, colonized by like Saxons and Romans and all that different thing. But I mean in terms of in modern day terms. They were the colonizers. They were the people going over and, you know, like Eddie Izzard has this really good sketch where he just kinda goes, uh you know, he's like, We went over, we planted a flag. And we're like, This is ours now and uh they're kind of like, Well you can't take it, we kinda live here. He's like, Do you have a flag? No flag, no country. <laughs> right. Or, I think uh, I did see that. Or Dylan Warren has another bit where he's like, the English did it in great style. They just came and was like, you, 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 fuck off. We're having Tiffin. Like, <laughs> and uh, everyone kind of just went, oh, fair, fair enough. So all right to wipe you off. Like, uh, but... So going by that, would you say that Irish people much? Well, you see, this thing is Irish society, the way like our politics and everything are structured is literally just from the shell of whatever England left right. us like our political system uh, it do, it's not the same as the English system now but in terms of how we run it like we it's have closely TDs followed. we have TDs which are Shakti Dollies which are just members of parliament that's what they have they have MPs you know they have a prime minister we have a Taoiseach um, they have a figure head of state which is the queen we have the president so, um, you know, in terms of structure, it's quite similar. And, you know, there are opinions, like, I mean, the laws about, like, homosexuality and, you know, different laws that were written into the Irish Constitution came from English laws. Right. They weren't, like, new things that the Irish had thought of themselves. They were just stuff that they took that they liked from the English laws. And then they just changed the stuff that they didn't like. Sounds like but, a good way to go about it, if you ask me, you know? Take the good things, see, fuck the bad things. No, you see, the good things in the minds of people who were like, well, you see, Bunrock and Heron was written in 1937. Right. By Amy de Valera, who was very heavily influenced by the Catholic Church. So, you know, even... even a lot of the good are, things that were good back then yeah. are slowing us down. Yeah. But you see, the thing is, I would see the Irish attitude to like uh, military stuff. That's where it really, like, where you really see the difference. In terms of like Ireland didn't fight the Second World War, we were neutral. We don't have an army that fights, it's an army that provides aid or provides protection of aid into uh, places of danger to give to, you know to civilians who are um, in danger zones that are you know, life-threatening and they need this aid and they need it you know, to live. We don't have uh, military missions. We don't have um, 
you know, an air force that, you know, actually drops bombs on anyone. We give more aid per capita than any other country in the world. We give our aid without any strings attached to it. Right. And in terms of that kind of uh, global attitude or that global communal attitude, Ireland is very good in terms of like, okay, America, for example, the USA will give aid to a country, but it could have like conditions attached to it. As in, we give you this money, but you can only spend this money on American goods. So it goes back into their economy. Whereas the Irish are like, here's this money. Please don't buy guns with it. Right. <laughs> we'll be going now. <laughs> They're trying to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, Ireland, you know, obviously has a long history in terms of we've had our own troubles and our own deal. That's that's a big game. Way Ireland looks. Reporting. Well, There's like what I noticed going to a different thing. There's such a great mindset for people with. Hmm. Like I have not. No, I I have never seen such thing like. Poland, you know, obviously last time I was probably in Poland was ten years. I can't really judge. But going by my experience, okay, you're in a wheelchair or you're mentally ill, take you in a hospital. Oh. You see, <laughs> if you rewind Ireland back a couple of years, you think you know, it'd be to the nineteen nine. I mean, uh, do you know the Magdalene laundries? Sorry. Magdalene laundries. Okay, Magdalene laundries were these uh, laundries that were run by nuns. Um, they were like they would take in the washing of the uh, community for like a price, right. and they do it, and it would get delivered back. Now the people, the laundries doubled up as a a place to send women. Now these are like some of these. There's actually a really good movie about it called Magdalene Sisters. Now some of the women were sent there because they had learning difficulties. And like the family could cope, or they were told to get rid of them, or any that kind of stuff. So there was that kind of stuff that went on. But some of the women, it was like, if you got pregnant outside of marriage, if you're an unmarried mother, you got sent there, you gave birth to the baby, the baby was taken away from you. Women who got raped were sent there. Women who even were, uh, who, who people thought were going to be slutty, or going to be promiscuous were sent there and hundreds and thousands of women died kept in these laundries for their entire life died there and put into mass graves not even a headstone to recognize them told that they were dirty and they were sinners and all this kind of stuff how recent was this the last laundry closed down in 1996 wow the report i think it's called the mcaleese report i don't even know if it's been released yet but the damage done by those laundries and I mean like there's been a couple of scandals in the last couple of years there's been one particularly about uh, it's been in the news recently there was a uh, um, not a case but it was a it must have been a case I'm presumed legal action was taken of uh, a, there was these disabled people different disabilities um i think most of them had like you know very severe down syndrome um really severe learning difficulties you know could have been really severely autistic or could have really bad asperger's or something okay um and they were you know in this home which was meant to be kind of like a you know a facility where they could kind of like uh you know get the help that they needed but in this home, they were really badly, like sexually abused, physically abused, you know, psychologically abused. And this is in the last like five, ten years. Yeah, I, I think I've heard bits. Um, oh, 
hungry. But I do agree. I think like in general, the Irish attitude is very good towards you know people with like mental yeah like illnesses. What what it's, happened uh, with these boundaries? Mental or physical? Sounds absolutely god awful. Hmm? It sounds god awful. What happened to these, to these women? Yeah. But looking at it today, not to anyway what happened. Uh, uh, down. But looking at it today, and I guess now that you said it, it could be greatly influenced by what happened. The mindset I have for disabled people today is amazing. Mm. I would say world class. For example, when uh, in Cavan, I I would be able to be able to be yeah. like they are intertwined into the community then as if it wasn't an issue. Well even in you know, where you know, we go to the University of Maynooth, like you know, you see people around whatever who have physical disabilities, who have your know, learning the difficulties you know of different severities but it's you're not treated any differently they're just treated the same as any other person will be and i think then, i think that's amazing i don't know why but in a way i think if this was another country they would have they would be looked down upon a whole lot because i don't see these people lead i don't see these you know, uh, people look out for the like. For example, I have a, I had a mate, Gavin, uh, at a Down syndrome, but he it wasn't it wasn't very bad. So he he was he was he wasn't he was only affected mostly physically and of obviously his. Uh, Learning, learning was slow, uh, but he was like anybody else. You could have a conversation with him. You could have, you could have the crack with him if, you know, as if he didn't have Down. Mm. And, you know, if I didn't get to experience that, I don't, you know, I think I would still be bigoted. Because you know, back, you know, as a child when. I Looked, they look different. They walk different. They don't I, like I was bigoted. I would, you know, I would look down on these people. I, I absolutely awful now. I look back on it because looking how I treat these. People, I don't even know why I say and um, treat people with disabilities. Actually, yeah, and I would definitely agree that like Irish people have come a long way from, you know, maybe the typical, you know, the stereotypical view that's taken of them. You know, that they're this really staunch Catholic country that you know, close-minded and all that kind of stuff. I do think Irish society is becoming more open, and you know, people with disabilities, you know, single mothers, women, you know. You know, people who are LGBT plus, you know, are becoming more and more, you know, acceptable. And there's more talk now in the media, and there's more talk, you know, in society about you know how we treat like people like travelers, how we treat, uh, you know, people who come in from foreign countries, immigrants, how we treat, uh, homeless people, how we treat loads of different people, how we treat the elderly even. And it's more, I think. I'm kind of glad to see that uh, Irish society is trying at least to become a little bit more socially aware. And even like, like a couple of years ago, like when my parents were growing up, no way in hell would you ever mention, like if you were feeling a bit down and you're feeling a bit sad. Right. Like it just wasn't talked about. Nowadays, you mean you see ads on the television, you you'll get talks in secondary school, you get talks in college, you get talks all the way up through 
your education about how important it is to say what's going on in your head and you know that's totally different to when, when my parents were growing up I mean obviously I come from a uh, I come from from a, from a family where one of my parents is a, a therapist right so obviously that's a topic that's very open in my house but I'd like to think that in more in a lot of houses it's becoming more of a thing that gets talked about and gets addressed it's no longer as to be of, yeah it's no longer get back to work yeah yeah. Well, people's problems. Yeah, that I, I like where we went on some fucking journeys, man. And this train is amazing. We've talked about some horrible shit. So I, I'm thinking, I thinking we should move over to some more positive things. So on. I started off on a positive note and all my other ones keep going way worse. <laughs> it started off positive and you My next this. topic is a Nazi, like I think you should move on. I, th- I think I think we should uh I think we should uh keep that topic. Uh end the show with something light hard. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh just a simple have a favorite team. Um, if you did, was it? I think probably my favorite TV show of 2015 was I was so so excited when Orange is the New Black season three came out because like I just it was it's such a good TV program like for anyone out there who watches it you already know like it's yo know, it's class and then for it's anyone amazing. who's who's oh, watched I watched it because I know like. I watched it with my uncles. Now my uncles, it was my uncle and his husband. Now they're, they're two gay fellas. And I'm like the first episode is f- like there's a scene where Morello and Nikki are in the showers and Morello is getting uh, oral sex off of Nikki. Now it's very vivid. <laughs> it's really uh. It's graphic. amazing. Yeah, well, of course <laughs> it's it. Um, it's very graphic. So I don't think they liked it because of, not because of you know that it was two women having sex. It was it was just the graphic, sex scene that they were gonna like whoa. <laughs> okay. So I think like a lot of people when I talk to them they're like oh I don't really like it or whatever they've only really watched one episode and they haven't really given it a chance. So probably for me yeah, it would definitely be Orange Is the New Black or uh, I'm a massive 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 Doctor Who and Sherlock fan. Right, of like, course. They're literally like my all time favourite T V shows. See, I couldn't I, I was thinking about getting into Sherlock Right. Yeah, you, you mean you mean Sherlock. Sherlock Right. Yeah, Sherlock. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I was never into any of those. Okay, I was into very popular. Breaking Bad watched it. The House of Cards watched it. Um, uh, for a while, Sons of Anarchy was popular. Watched oh, that. Love Sons of Anarchy. Yeah, I finished it. Wanna... Finished the whole. And I, I was. Fairness, I did laugh my ass off about the IRA storyline. Oh man, that was so twisted. Like there was, there was literally zero truth. Well, I thought, like, did they not just like? They made it up. Hollywood, Hollywood do this thing where they're just like, oh, we we have this like a uh, storyline that involves Irish people, but we get actual Irish people to play the parts, or we just get Americans ah. can't do the accent. But did, what, wasn't there a couple of Irish actors? I'm pretty there sure there was like two or three, but yeah, yeah. the main ones were awful. Oh, uh, it was. Um, it's like, it still... was real. The garbage is it's kind of thing. It it was only horrible because. We can, you know. Obviously, we know the difference. We know the difference because fucking you are Irish. I live in Ireland for the last fucking decade, and we we know what the rah is really like yeah. and really was like. And seeing all this crap is so cringy. 
But on the other hand, it's so entertaining. I think there's... It's so entertaining to think that the world thinks that Ireland's like that. <laughs> and also, why would the IRA be anyway involved? Like a fucking motorcycle fucking gang. Oh, like, yeah. what the fuck? Who in Northern Ireland fucking owns a Harley anyway? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> It'd be the posh fucking British people left over. That's but it's it. not even that. It's the impracticality of having a motorcycle in Ireland. Like, it um, rains too much. So bad. No, but it, the one good thing about it is it kept you fucking interested. I watched the whole thing. Oh, yeah. we I watched loads of shite telly, but, like, the acting is awful, the plot is awful, but I'm, like, totally addicted to it. Yeah. Oh, man. What's the worst thing? So, you know, that people usually would hate on that you love. You have a TV show that is horrible, loved, regardless. Uh, well, you know, I know, you see, because I, I absolutely loved Desperate Housewives. Like, I was obsessed with it. I cried for, like, a no, week No, but see, that was an all right show. I watched that shit like, with my parents. Yeah, but you see, like... It depends, like, because some people really liked it and some people really didn't like it. And then I watch Pretty Little Liars and people are like, oh, it's such a shit show or whatever. I really like it. I really like the storyline. I think it's no. a good show. God. And, like, see, I, that, no, that's a good example. But you see, like, I wouldn't be like, oh, yeah, it's a class show. You should watch it. I'm just like, yeah, it's about this. Watch it if you want. Like, You know what I think is absolutely god-awful? And people come over. What? Supernatural. I, I don't like Supernatural. It's so shit. I've watched clips from it. I watched uh, highlights. Highlights. The good bits. It's, oh my god, it's so shit. Like, the latest highlight I watched from was uh, a guy finds one of the main characters, you know, he's super fucking natural. Yeah. Right? So can't kill him. Well, he can, but he can't. And that was fucking plot. It's basically a duel between like solid five minutes, but there's no action. They like fight, see, like, but my it's, best friend it's a scene. Supernatural. It's so I shit. It's it. so bad. Like, like I've, I've had three or four people who I'm friends with who are like, you have to watch Supernatural. Like someone gave me the box set of the DVDs. Oh. Like they let, they let me borrow it. I, I think I got like one season in. I was like, this is a waste of my time. It really is. Like, it's so fucking horrible. It's literally as filler. So fucking teenage girls can have something to talk about. It's conversation fit. Like, and it's making millions of dollars. Like, holy shit. But you see, the thing is, like, let's say we're, like, Desperate Housewives, whatever. No, Desperate Housewives, that show was so ridiculous. That it was yeah, but it was like it was actually trying to be serious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just like there was a fucking plane crash on the the lane once, and there was a tornado that hit them, and there was <laughs> loads of different shite, and everyone was sleeping with each other, and there was like mixed up babies, and someone was having someone else's baby, and it was just great. Blind blind husband. Yeah, and just cheating like, on the blind husband. Yeah. Oh man, I watched just, too much. Then. <laughs> I love Gabby was my favorite character. I love Gabby. I don't remember the name. Uh, Eva Longoria Parker was Gabby. Oh my god. She was my favourite character. And I liked Brie as well, the red-haired one. Oh, I she like I up. like the fucking... Which one, Susan? The one that was always plot shit. I'd like... Oh, Evie. She, she fucking killed Evie. someone. Was she blonde? I think so. Yeah, it was Evie. That one was... Loved watching it, yeah. so I could like remember what she's. Like. I mm. would never get <laughs> <laughs> because like that shit would. Just... What uh, was I... your favorite program of 2015? My favorite. The as you. Mm-hmm. Good. Uh, I loved the ending. In the yeah. And I, I fucking all cried. We see. Uh, well, I don't want to ruin the ending for anyone, so I won't say. Yeah, yeah. We're not gonna talk about. It. And 
and uh, other than that, I've only watched, I rewatched Breaking Bad this Yeah. And I've started... I liked Breaking Bad, but it was kind of like the, it was, it was kind of one of those programs that I would only really watch once. I wouldn't go back and rewatch it. Right, yeah. No, I think it's like... That's why. But uh, if I didn't have... If I didn't watch it the first time, I only... If I was looking for the... I would probably... Because it, yeah. it's so slow at the start. Yeah. Or still are super slow. Literally... Wait, see, actually, do you know what I discovered this year that I love? Downton Abbey. I watch it with my mom. I never watched it. And uh, it's meant to be like the pinnacle of British comedy. Downton Abbey. It's not a comedy, but it's about like British society. Or no, but it's it's, it's taken as. Oh yeah, there's bits that are really funny, but like. I love it. Like I, me and my mom do watch it. Like when we're just in the house by ourselves, and I love it. Like I love finding out about all the like because it's about like this like family who live in Downton Abbey, whatever, and they're quite you know well off and they're posh, whatever. And it's all about their servants as well. And I love kind of going, oh, you know, Thomas is doing this and fucking, oh, Mrs. Hughes is doing this. And, like I get really invested in their lives. Right. You know, I or, think that's just because you're. Old. Well, no, I don't think it's because of all I think it's because <laughs> I, I, I love, like, Jane Austen and all that kind of stuff. And I love period dramas, so that kind of feeds into that. Right, yeah. No, I don't like shows. That's, I don't know, like, um, there's a word for shows like that. It's called Lee. They grab you on, and I think by the end of it, no, you're no longer interested in whatever's happening. You just want to know what happened. Yeah. Like, Okay, but what happened? You don't even have to watch the show. You have to. You just no, I ask I want to watch the show for the most so. part. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. Whereas, like with Pretty Little Liars, at this point, I'm just kind of like, oh, just explain what happened, because <laughs> it's like, in the first season, the premise of it is like there's these uh, five girls who are best friends. One of them goes missing. Um, she, her body is found, whatever, and uh, they start getting these texts of this anonymous person that knows all their secrets because they told the friend that went missing, all their secrets. And um this this person that's called A starts blackmailing or whatever. Now this is the premise that started in the first season. Right. I am half I, we are halfway through the sixth season. And we found out who A was, but now there's someone else blackmailing them. What the fuck? And at this point I'm just like, oh lads, please. <laughs> He's got stuff. <laughs> like, uh, send the Ryan there and sort them out, whatever. Uh, you just want someone to come in. Uh, person watching this, you know who you are. Go, ah, stop. <laughs> stop. <laughs> stop. <laughs> uh, inside jokes are the. There's a story to that. There's a story to that now, but uh, we'll have to have them on the show if we. Uh, what was your favourite movie of 2015? Favourite movie of 2000? I would have to say... Favourite movie... See, recently I watched... Eight. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it was favourite movie. I think my favourite movie... I I'm not even sure. Too. I'm not even sure if it came... My favourite movie this year was... Definitely Star Wars. Star Wars. Yeah. Like, I don't want to be a total nerd, but it was a fucking class for them. Like, it was great. Like, it, in, I'm not invested. In of, oh, you see, I'm a massive Star Wars fan. I know all, like, if you... I know the words to the movie. Okay. As in, I can say the words along with the movie. I've loved them since I was a kid or whatever. And when I heard that Disney, were ma- Disney had bought Lucas Films and that they were making the new ones, I was like so determined that they were going to be shit. Right. Like, they're just going to be shit. They're going to totally fuck So you were biased before, negatively. Before, yeah. Yeah. Go, go and in. I went in and I was like, that was actually so good. Like, I understand that what they did was they kind of like used all the old cast and the old kind of like, you know, like uh, Han Solo and Princess Leia and all those pe- like people. 
and you know Chewie and all those kind of older original cast to yeah. set up the story so yeah. it was kind of more like they were kind of going okay that's like kind of a nod to the original series now we can go off on our own arc now and they set it up really well stuff. And like they did sit at And what do you what what do you think of the two new main characters? Uh, I think w- it was. W- would you say they're they're as memorable? Or the last. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, I like the way that they brought in kind of a bit of diversity in terms. Of it's not just like white people playing right. all the roles. Like Finn obviously is a black guy, and you know Ray is uh, a girl. And she's one of the main characters, and she's not like a love interest either. She's like a warrior. Yeah, like Leia in the first one was kind of like, like you know. She was even. She was even. Not to look at. No, and also she was even portrayed as a love. Fucking. Half the movie. She was a love. Interest. Yeah. No, I think I think it's a good idea. I, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen. Although I am not complaining about the Princess Leia bikini thing. What do That's you mean? Literally, the only reason the sixth movie is my favorite movie. Oh right, of course, right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's there's more there's more pictures, during that big, that were only released. Album because they are. are on. Harry Fisher, good looking woman back. Then. And she's a big alcohol problem problem actually. Well, that's why she looks like she. <laughs> <laughs> to be completely honest, like. <laughs> Fucking hell, that man. No, no uh, but, uh, I was gonna say. But what your favorite movie was? What hey, you liked Hateful Eight, and you liked? No, Hateful I liked Eight. Hateful Eight. Probably the best. Like I, I really did like Star Wars, and it would probably be up there as one of my favorites. I saw. I don't think it came. I don't think I watched enough year. movies this year. I didn't go to the movies all that much this year. I don't think it's. It, I don't think it came out this year, but I saw it in 2015. It was called the, um, what's it called the Imitation Game. I found about that. It made me cry, and usually I'm kind of like you know, it's kind of like oh, it's a fucking movie kind of thing. Okay. But it like the story behind it and the acting was just so good and so real that it just made me cry. I mean. Wanna watch the movie from twelve eleven though. It was a small budget. Tommy Lee Jones. Not as small budget as you imagine. But it's called The Sunset Limited. Oh. Then whole movies locked up locked up. And it's basically Professor tries to kill, kill himself, and Jackson. I can't remember. Saves a janitor. Saves him. Oh. You know, called the sunset limit. The whole movie is their conversation after Samuel brings him back home. They just talk for like two hours. Oh. It's such an interesting, so well done, of the movie, and you know, it, there's a lot of religious connotation in the movie because mm-hmm. I think it, and um, that's not why, but I think, um, as it gets people asking, but it, it, it if you. If you can look past that, wanna check out a good. Well, oh, n- n- nevertheless, it's in- I have to say, watch it. It's not a TV series on any on Facebook. If you give it, if you give it time, it's very interesting. Actually, what I watched last night with my sister and my mom, I watched this movie called Horns. And Danny Radcliffe's in it. Oh, but I've heard bad things. I actually, I, I don't think it's meant to be a comedy, but I was laughing a bit, like it was dark. 
So oh, I don't think it's meant. The premise of the movie is that like this guy, his girlfriend's murdered, and he's accused of it. Okay. And he got like blackout drunk and he can't really remember, but he knows he didn't murder her. And anyway, he like turns his back on God and all this kind of stuff, and he grows horns, as if he's the devil, and people start confessing their sins to him. Okay. And like, loads of weird shit. Like he goes to the doctor when he first gets the horns, whatever, and. He, uh, <laughs> he, uh, he's sitting in the waiting room and there's like this woman and her child and the child is screaming, like, I mean, screaming, like, I was getting almost to the point where the scene was going on so long, I wanted to turn off the movie because I hated the child. <laughs> right. And, like, the mother turns around to halfway, like, when he's sitting on the bus, you know, sometimes I wish I could just kick my daughter up the ass. Like, I wish I could just kick her up the ass. It's like... Or just drive off and leave her here. Just drive off. And then, like, the secretary, like, starts going, um, I really want to scream at that woman about her child or whatever. And uh, then the child turns around and is like, I, I dream about burning mommy under the bed, burning her up, 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 whatever. <laughs> it gets so dark. And then, like, the doctor... It gets so like, dark and yet you're laughing through yeah, all you're of laughing. this. Yeah, like, you're laughing. Like, the doctor was talking about how he, like, takes oxycodone or whatever. Yeah. For the crack, like, and how he thinks about his daughter's like best friend in a sexual way. Wow, okay, and like all this weird shit, and it's just really funny. It also gets really sad, but like, it's funny, like, but it like it's ridiculous, it's a ridiculous movie. Okay, right, right. I think, I think we've talked on for long enough, it's just, it's just over an hour. I think it's that. Bye. Bye. Uh, so, bye. Grand poll number one is out. Uh, hopefully, see you guys next week.